you. Um, uh, thank you, Simon. And um, it's um, a delight to be here. And also, um, the connections over the years are a fantastic thing. And Simon actually is somebody who was selected from a painting of mine, saw a painting of mine in a, in a Whitechapel Open show in 1991, I think. So, and came, called me cold without knowing I was, I wanted to come to the studio. So it's amazing how these things work out. Um, but I'm also, was when I was asked to um, come and talk, um, invited to come and talk with um, Dan, I was really excited because um, I don't think enough, um, there's enough about painters talking to each other generally. And we did also think, I think we kind of thought that the fact that when you get two painters together, it is quite interesting. We do talk primarily about being painters and painting. So I think we will not talk very much individually about all the works in the show. We will talk a lot more generally about painting. And for me also, um, I think the show upstairs um, is an incredibly generous exhibition. And when I say that, I think um, that I find it very exciting to see the, because I've seen um, Dana's work from an earlier period, and then to see what's going on now, and then to see all this kind of quite open-ended possibilities um, within the painting, and also the excitement of where the work is going to go to. I think that's always, for me anyway, it's always very exciting to experience that and think I want to see more paintings by this person. Um, so perhaps to start, um, it'd be good, it would be nice also for us to know a little bit about how you got to um, the sort of path to art school, how going to Cleveland, Ohio to do your BFA was, and then the difference between then going to New York in the <coughs> early, what, 2000, and, and also, and then to perhaps expand out a bit about that period of time and what's happened yeah. since. Um, yeah, can you hear me? And <laughs> great. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I went to uh, Cleveland Institute of Art um, in Cleveland, Ohio. That's a uh, it, it's a it's a small city in in a, in the U.S. and um, people sometimes call it the armpit of the U.S. <laughs> but I liked it. I had a great time. It's very industrial, and it was in the Rust Belt, um, and it was a really good um, program. It was very uh, departmentalized. So if you were in painting, you were really in painting, um, and they had a really long foundation period where it was a lot of drawing and um, figure drawing and uh, like watercolor was a whole semester. But um, I think when I first started thinking about contemporary painting, you know, it was around this time, so it was around the mid to late 90s, and um, and that's where I, I learned about your work, and it was like, I feel like it was a really exciting time, because it felt like a very permissive time for painting, and, and it felt like um, people were, um, it, w it was also a kind of conflict too. I don't know if this is just an art school thing where you, you read text maybe from the 80s or or, 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 or just texts and, and, the, and it was very much about like, um, I think directed against uh, neo-expressionism at that time, which was um, a sort of movement that happened in the, I don't know if it was a movement, but something that was happening in the 80s. Um, and. And so there is this tough thing because you would sort of say like people would be talking about gesture and how it was very, you, you know, you, you couldn't be doing it or it was very loaded. But then I'd be seeing painters like Dexter or, or Laura Owens or, you know, people who were using um, painterly language and, and gesture and making paintings that were possible. So I think then for me the anxiety was like sort of like how do you push that further? Like do you, can you just make a painting that's, like painterly, and and does it have to have all these associations alongside of it? Um, and so that was, I think, something I was dealing with then. And then I think by the time I had gone, I moved to New York in 2000, right before September 11th. So um, it it kind of felt. I think that at, at that time around September 11th, I think that's when it started to feel like there was a shift. Um, in generally just in the discussion, but I think in terms of what people were making and and thinking about painting. I think some of my hang-ups about like whether you could just 
maybe about language or, or how to make a painting. It, it started to feel um, just m maybe more open for me, or, or I just felt like I could just did make a painting. Or something. Do you think that? But I have I have never heard someone say that the idea of that event actually affected. Yeah, you know, September 11th made me do it. <laughs> no, I, sorry. In terms of lots of people sorry. thinking about the, there was a shift in a sudden sort of what was. You know what was in the air in terms of what was yeah. interesting about making, if it was to do with making paintings. Well, I really felt like there was a uh, somehow 2000 felt like it belonged to the 90s yeah. in a way. Um, I just remember seeing paintings where you there would be a, like a big bl bright blue expanse of field, like a sky and like little elements in it, and um, people were making. I don't know. It was uh, paint uh, somehow a lot of photographs with airplanes in them and people were talking about globalism and all these things and then it, uh, when that happened I think at least in New York it sort of felt like it became a local event so like this idea of it, something being this global idea about art sort of felt like much more local or potentially subcultural like and maybe that was a shift um, I think at that time there's a lot of artists who were making work that were much more about their own kind of personal um, Subcultures, or um, and what was your work looking like at that time then? But when you like when you finished your BA to when you went to Columbia, I think at that time I was really lost, like completely lost, and um, I was making paintings. They looked kind of um, they looked like photographic, even though they weren't from photographs. They, but I I thought there's something about the language of um, something looking kind of like an image that was reduced or like it had already been pictured, that that somehow seemed like um, interesting or important, like it was an already an important image. Um, so I, but that was like, I think that was something that I sort of got away from later on, because like a lot of the paintings were coming then from more narrative sources or um, kind of hypothetical situations that I was thinking of. And um, so I think, but uh, yeah, there, uh, like color, I wasn't really using color very much. It was, they were very Richtery. They looked a lot like Luke Toyman's. <laughs> like I was trying to make Luke Toyman's paintings, but they were awkward. <laughs> like so what was the, like so what, what do you feel that in, in, in terms of time and in your, <coughs> in your painting career, that it was a sort of year zero at some point, you thought, okay, now actually I've started now, which is the thing I'm really, I can recognize as myself, or was it more gradual? I think it was like maybe, uh, I think it was probably accepting that I, w I wanted to make a certain kind of painting and that it was okay. Like I remember um, the first time I showed paintings was in 2001 in New York and it was in a, at PS1 and I probably shouldn't, is this being live streamed? This is being live streamed, I shouldn't say this, but whatever. I'll just say it. It was true. It happened. <laughs> like, and um, I just remember at that time it was like, you know, it was it was, it was October two thousand one, and I had was making these paintings of like the last man on earth from observation. Um, so it was kind of an unfortunate time to be making those paintings about the end of the world, <laughs> you know, because um, I think there's always these anthrax scares happening at that time, and. Um, but the, you know the paintings were rough. You know, like there is, th that was kind of building out the surface. There it was a lot of thick paint. There's sort of gesture. Um, I remember the sides of the paintings were a little scuffy. I, I remember that because I didn't notice it in the studio. And then when I finally brought them to PS One to show them, it was I felt embarrassed. But I, what happened was the director just hated the paintings, like completely hated them. Like she just <laughs> said, like. Like, you must be the worst painter I've ever met in my life, <laughs> you know? And I was like, you know, 22, I was like, I, I, I didn't ask for this. <laughs> or I was like, <laughs> or like 24 maybe, but like, and, um, and it was like, it was, it was like terrible, you know? It was like, felt really embarrassed. And, and then I, 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 there's that moment where you start to think, well, why, like, why would she say this? And then um, I said, well, it, it just doesn't look like what el what's in the museum like I was walking around and everything like looked really slick and there wasn't like fingerprints on the edge of the painting <laughs> you know like it, there was a lot of um, kind of glossy sort of taped off paintings and and you know paintings that I liked or was attracted to but I wasn't making those paintings 
And so that I think at that moment it became like a position, like it was like, okay, I'm, it's okay that I'm not making those paintings. And but but, um, but we but we were also thinking then about the idea of making and the whole sort of debate about bad painting as a thing as well. I mean, in res in response to that, I think I yeah, I think I just never knew what that was at that time, you know, because I always thought like, what do you mean bad painting? Like it's. I think it's really good. Or they'd be like, oh, like Immendorf or, or um, uh, o Albert Olin. I, mean, I just thought like Albert Olin was like the best painter that you could imagine. Like they were so sophisticated and great paintings. And um, but you know, then I realized it's like coming from a you know historical position. Um, but I I always think that it was just you know that it's always like you're just always trying to make the kinds of paintings that you want to see or that you're interested in. And so it was never like this judgment of like, oh, this is bad or this is good. Because I actually didn't really feel like I knew what a good painting what would you know look like. I, could, I knew when a painting worked or something, but it was never like, oh, this is, like there's just paintings you could like or not like or something. And also um, in terms of using um, the figure, you know, rather than not using the figure. I just wanted because there are several, I mean, I think there's a fame, uh, Patrick Caulfield, you know, Patrick Caulfield, yeah. the British painter. I mean, he said, um, there was an interview with him, and he said he felt that, he felt that Picasso had pulled the plug on the figure, and that's why he felt he, he had a real problematic relationship with it. But I don't know if it's that generation, particularly of that period, was still struggling with, what do you do with this giant behind you? And, and that now that it's all that it's worked through in a different way, that it has a more natural relationship with making figurative painting, because all, all that the, the the way that painting was in the 1980s, and they seemed to behave so badly and yeah. was so discredited in the early 90s that that kind of worked its way through and it was okay again. Yeah. Well, well, what was the feeling? Because we knew graduated was 86, or yeah, was it yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that I, I experienced sort of the in, in England, there was this big new spirit of painting in the early 80s. So suddenly, for example, Philip Guston became like, a, uh, suddenly the American painter Philip Guston became like a god. Because right. he had this show at the Whitechapel in, in the early 80s. And it kind of made so much sense because we were still being <coughs> taught mostly by people at St. Martin's who were really abstract expressionist, or that was their real thing, even though it was then, you know, 30 years past, it was still, that was still the real, the truth, you know, that was the real right. cross, if you like. And pop hadn't really, although pop had happened in England, it kind of fizzled out again in the 80s. It, mm -hmm. it, all that, I mean, it's difficult now in retrospect, but someone like Warhol by 85 was not seen within art schools as an interesting artist, right. you know, because he was becoming a little bit of a joke, because he was hanging around with Duran Duran, and right. it was all yeah, becoming yeah, a bit, like you know, <laughs> it was becoming a little bit, you know, unpalatable. It's like, and it's interesting how that was all reclaimed, in a way, in the mid-90s, in, yeah. in, in London, again, because pop became so important with YBA, in a way. Right. You know I mean? So it connected back up. Yeah. But I think that it's still very difficult to make, um, there was still this thing of, if you make figurative painting, it's not really making figurative serious paint. painting in some yeah. way. Do you know what I mean? That that was right. still a, perhaps a thing around. If you want to make serious painting, it should be not quite, you know, right. seem to be. I wonder it. if it's, yeah. And I also think that thing about um, the trouble with painting things which are recognizable is mm -hmm. that um, I remember there was an interview with Philip Guston about. Someone says, comes to the studio and says, what's that in that corner of that painting, Phil? And he says, well, it's a piece of four by two with a nail in it. Right. He said, you wouldn't ask Rothko that question, would you? I mean, you can't use, right. you know, yeah. you <laughs> like don't have, I don't have to, you know, if there's a shoe in a painting, it's a, it's a shoe, but it's not a shoe, it's a painting. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, that so idea it's that somehow if you don't have images, then you don't have that problem because people just see it as painting. Right, And yeah. I think... For me, your paintings are very much painting, but the first reading of them is that you you see them as images, obviously first, and yeah. then they are, but they are very complex and ambitious as right. taking one the viewer. Yeah. I want to trip through. I'm a painting now. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes it's hard to ignore, or like 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 uh, that it is a painting because you know you're 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 making it, but uh, also. Um, 
I think with figuration, it really is tricky because it's on this continuum. So there's moments where it can get too tight or too slowed down, but too much of a face. And so then it's like, how do you loosen it so that there's room for the viewer? Because I always think that there should be room for the viewer. And maybe that's the trouble with like, if it gets too, um, too pinned down, then it shuts everything else out. Um, and also, they can, they can hold this tension to it, and then it uses a kind of pulley mm -hmm. thing to make it keep the tension in check. And so what you're, so talking about, so I, yeah. I think this is an incredibly strange painting to stand in front of and to continue to look at. Yeah. Because it makes you, um, it makes you comp go completely from I'm looking at an image, I'm looking at the paint, I'm looking at the image, and so the representational part of it flips continually. Right as you're looking at it, you know what I mean? So it's very, very complex and it makes you think all the time about you painting it as well. Right. So you're, you're sort of short circuits it back to this mark and that mark and then you suddenly feel, is that a Jasper Johns or is that the, the Munch painting? Right, that, yeah. You know, so it's just continually. That's a great paint. That Munch bedspread is great. <laughs> the Jasper Johns whole sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I know that, that one bedspread, it's amazing. <laughs> Um, no, I mean not the whole thing. Painted by Munch called um, "Between the Clock and the Bed." It's a very late painting. It's a great it's painting. It's, it's around half a clock, and then Munch is a self-portrait, and then the next to him is a bedspread, and the bedspread is basically painted in zigzag, white and black, like red and black lines, which Jasper Johns then picked up as a motif, which is an enormous amount of work for Munch. Yeah. But the um. Yeah, I think with th with that painting, I was really interested in it, like a painting that was turned inside out. Um, almost like if a sweater was turned inside out, and so you could see all the seams, but also you could see maybe all the um, the lexicon that in which it was made up of, or like this sort of, and then also the tools of, of making a painting. I mean, you don't use a saw, but I think that just using tools in it, it sort of felt like, um, like painting tools, or like this sort of um, kind of language that could be used. Um, I didn't necessarily think of it so much as a disparate language, but that it was more of these kind of gestures, like almost like if you're opening up a, um, a book or, and also I just I wanted it to be simultaneous, like that the subject itself was opening itself up and there's always that thing too about like, um, just also just a very extroverted painting or, but. but there's a, there seems to be a desire then in, in, in several of these to make them not only are they physically made in terms of how you make them, you know, how they're being painted on, but there's a real physical sense of a composition, sort of almost of trying to justify the rectangle that's, that squeezes it in, and then that, that fan painting as well, where it's kind of stretching. And that, and that, and but the actual thing being depicted is also very, very physical, like someone yeah. pulling a shirt off with a trouser about to come off, or shaving, or you know, flashing. Yeah. Or earlier on, you know, <coughs> sneezes and, you know, that, that there's a desire to, and I'm interested in that idea of what is that about the, the, the you, want to, you want to get it all in there, the physical thing. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this recently with paintings, just that, that I, the paintings I'm attracted to, I think I like the sense of consequence, like even in abstract paintings where you feel like one form actually has weight or it can do something to something else and um, and maybe I think it's also that thing of where you're actually physically making the thing and then the thing feels like it has a, a body itself like the painting has a body and then you have a body but not in a Catholic way you know <laughs> like it's not about never mind <laughs> every time I think about like the body I think I don't know it's not so much about the body but but that there is a sort of sense of touch or proximity I think um, because, you know, paintings are experienced frontally, and so I just think there's that kind of mirroring between um, the viewer and and the actual painting as a physical thing. Um, and subject can come into that, I think, too, uh, like how you relate to it. Like, there's, I always love this Maria Lastnick painting of, like, the woman with a gun to her head, but she's also pointing it at the viewer. It's like this thing that becomes this really activated, um, confrontation um, but it's it's also you know it's like an image but it feels like it somehow goes beyond just an image you know because it 
it's it's such a address. But do you also get a sort of bit when you're making them? Some, sometimes do you do you start to think oh, this is a bit that's just a bit too far? I, mean, I imagine with the shading painting, you're at a point thinking, is that gonna? Can I show this yeah. painting? So that is that. Is there, a, is there some censorship which comes in? Uh, is there something is that you just wouldn't go there? Or would you just think, I'm just going to be cool and, and as tough as I can? I'm just going to let it all out? I think it's just a, it becomes a, the choices of like making the thing, like how, what you include and what you, what you don't include. And, and that I think I like that too when there's a subject that y you feel like you, you don't want, you can't make because you don't know how it would work. You know, there I made this painting of like someone, a woman giving birth, and I just didn't know how that would work. Also, just painting it, like it just seemed too loaded. But then, I th it was that became a question of like, okay, well, how could it work? And then I felt like, oh, it was really important that there's another painting in the painting, so that she could be looking at something, and then I guess the painter could also be looking at something else, besides her downtown. <laughs> area, <laughs> you know, but there's also like this relationship between that picture and the bed. You know, so I, I kind of, I think it's like a painting. You can have um, a lot of different associations, and so I think that that, like you, like when you say something in language, it, it sounds like it could be a really terrible idea. But then you think of like, oh God, how could that work? You know. Like the shaving painting, I thought, well, if she's sort of kind of like one of those dolls, like those. Um, wooden model dolls or something like, like not really a quite a human form, or it looks like she's almost like a reflection in a mirror, like her body so angular. Um, I think those decisions were made it made it okay. Like where if it was just like a a woman, and then that other situation, you know, it's sort of. And is it, is uh, it key that she's not looking? At yeah. The and then her head was sort of on the horizon, and because it sort of felt like her hat was sort of tipped on the horizon. Because another thing which seems to be quite common is this, and also the, the problem I often have with things we paint and doing is, is that whole that old old thing is you think that's if you paint the eyes while you remain in the room. Oh yeah, <laughs> is that the way you use eyes is um, is very interesting because often or hardly ever is there a figure actually looking back at you, or if right. they are, they've had their eyes poked out circles or they're not they're not looking at you as you know yeah <laughs> no, that's just not really <laughs> there's something quite interesting about the idea of that sight thing which seems to be yeah the, you know the idea that, that you're not confronting the door you, the way in is not through the eyes of the of the head of the figure that you have to get in through a different right yeah and is that deli and is that a deliberate conscious thing or is that just how you i think it's e in making it because you'll be painting a figure, and then th sometimes it'll look too much like. Maybe it'll be too illustrative, or it'll feel too fast, or um, too much of a, a dress. And so, I think there's always that. Like Goya does that really well, where the eyes sort of space out, and then you feel like you can. Then you can look at the figure or something, or or have a different relationship to them. And, um, but yeah, I was thinking about this because the one with the eyes in the. I felt like the snow was really important in that painting because it's sort of about vision or this sort of like uh, blinding quality of the of the snow in in that painting. Um, so yeah, I think it's a tricky thing. It's like how to because sometimes you really want them to be looking at the viewer, but then they can be really annoying. Like that, uh, it's like more of a tolerance of like how. Do you do you find that like sometimes there's paintings if the viewer if it's looking at the viewer. It can be really annoying. <laughs> well, it's just, uh, it's I mean, I think it's a little bit this idea of like focus as well, isn't it? And yeah. I mean, I think that's what's interesting again about how you direct the eye of the viewer around your painting. Yeah. Because, as I say, if there are, if we have basically eyes in our head, that's the focus of the painting. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's like the, yeah. So that's where you go to. So, and I think the way that you avoid that deliberately, and the way you get us into your painting, by maybe we get in through the toe or something. Oh key yeah. Way into that painting somehow. Do you think that once you think, oh, I know what that could feel like when you've got a pebble 
going to the toilet. If you can make right. it so there's a physical feeling, but then you go in and it's all very <coughs> constructed. And I like the way that you know you go round and it seems to be that you're deliberately the shifting focus is directed in the way yeah. you want it to be, which is what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's what makes it it in it so let's say short circuits back at the back the, the viewer back into thinking I'm looking at a painting, I'm looking at a painting, I'm looking right. at a painting. Right. Yeah. Whereas that the and the way that they it doesn't work quite like that in reproduction though, does it? And that's the thing I think I they become more graphic when reproduced again. Right. You see in this painting, for example, they have this very dominant sort of physical experience. Yeah. No, I think that makes. I mean, that's really the the thing. I think with with uh, any kind of maybe it's true with any kind of painting, but I definitely I think w when you because of the organization of a face is so dominant. You know, it's like so uh, such an immediate thing that it, that is the sort of. Um, trick to figure out like how it can work with the <coughs> with the painting or like that toe like that's so th like that was important because I felt like that's like this sort of balance like like that whole painting felt like okay well if, if they slip then they're in the fan or something <laughs> you know so it's like this is like the one sensitive part that's like trying to hold it together or something yeah. but um yeah it's there, uh, you know, the one painting that in there I really eye contact was important was the getting dressed one. Like I just thought, okay, well that's such a chaotic painting that there had to be eye contact, at least with one eye, because yeah. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that that's like the it needed that, you know. And um, could you talk a bit about American painting as well, because we're sort of in Wakefield. Yeah. I'm a British artist, <laughs> an American artist, but, but and the kind of experience of you know, obviously what you have been interested in pi other figurative American painters as well, compared to what we've kind of been exposed to here in terms of British figurative painters. Yeah. And I'm just wondering that whole thing about, um, there seems to be this, the difference between your work not really being located within pop so much as a kind of that different sort of alternative pop American painters with that really Chicago imagist and oh, yeah. the hairy beard. Jim Nutt and a yeah. different sort of a different strand of sort of slightly under the radar yeah. figuration. Do you know what I mean? Which I suppose um, that we don't know so well here either. Right. I think because those, those artists don't tend to be. I think a lot of Americans don't even know them so well. They're in Chicago. They call them the Harry Who. They were they were kind of going on at the same time that pop art was going on in um, or that they emerged at that. And actually, I think at that time. This is what I heard. It could be totally wrong. Is that that there was it would actually was a question of like what the, the art scene would be like New York or Chicago and like like maybe it could be the Harry Who like we were making these kind of more comic booky like really wild imagery. But um, I think initially when I saw those paintings like images of them I didn't like them because I thought they were almost too graphic and um, I just felt. But I now I've, I've kind of I like I like Peter Saul. A lot. I think his paintings are really yeah. sick I mean in a great way. Like <laughs> the difference to those who don't can't yeah. sort of visualize it is that the paintings look more like the sort of paintings of the furry freak brothers than paintings of advertising. You know, yeah. It, it was a whole. It wasn't just found imagery imagery within, you know, the idea of com the commercial imagery or finding yeah. certain iconic images. It was like finding this kind of generic other alternative. Yeah. And pop that comic book art, which is, you know, like Robert Crumb as well. Is right. Example. Yeah, it was m maybe more individual. Like, but I always feel with British art, with British pop, felt I always thought it was much more interesting than American pop because it was darker <laughs> and kind of more, <laughs> um, and actually more personalized or something. Like, it felt kind of strangely uh, more narrative or personalized than, than um, what was g than American. Yeah. You know, it's true. <laughs> it's it's also. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Alex Katz was talking about. Um, he was talking about the uh, British nineteenth-century portrait of T. Uh, Lawrence, and he was saying the great thing about English painting is it's so elegant. You think, God, I'm elegant. That's not yeah. unusual. Someone actually thinks English painting is 
fantastic. Oh, yeah. And inherent, when it's good, it has this inherent elegance. And you kind of, when you hear someone say that from the outside, you suddenly start thinking of the way that Gainsborough um, concerts were in a way. That there, is a, it's, there is this kind of thing, and also someone like Ernie Hockney. Right. The kind of inherent, there is something about it. I think I see what you mean when, when looking at it as a thing. Yeah. From the whereas, when you look at it, because I think from here, like American pop seems so much more grown up and big and to the full story. Just sort of. You know, the British pop culture is a provincial thing that was actually happening. Yeah, but it. Was really happening in the sort of centre in the way that, you know, the foundry and the factory. What right. Were but do you feel like it's, it's effect, it's like the way that it's kind of, um, affected other art other generations of artists that there's actually more mileage yeah, like you can actually do things more with i'm trying to think of like well patrick caulfield or like yeah. there's like well i think it's very i think again it's about this thing of time how things change i think you know the in the in the end i think to say patrick caulfield was a pop artist is a, it, the label itself becomes problematic and actually he's, yeah. he's very interested in making a version of quite traditional painting in a new way, I think, because of all yeah. the, the pop element is really, you know, it's there, but you think in another hundred years' time, it just looks like the lips. Right. It's quite, quite interesting, very kind of serious and quite, mm -hmm. you know, quiet paintings in a way. Yeah. And I think that maybe the trickle down is that is that things change. I mean, I mean, perhaps that we should talk a bit about the idea of ideas and currency now, because I think that is something mm -hmm. which... Um, that anyone who's making art at any time is kind of aware of these debates, which can possibly be linked to what one is doing, or can right. possibly be completely happening not. somewhere else. Yeah, and then what do you, it's like this thing of what do you do when yeah. it's not your your thing? You know, you, you appreciate it, but it's not your, you know. I mean, I don't yeah. know that when you, by the time you got to college in New York, kind of, the, 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 theory, the, the heavy theory which was happening in the 90s was beginning to evaporate and it was really easing off. It felt easier. I thought like somehow going to Columbia for graduate school, because they have such a great art history program, I, and they didn't have very many painters either. I think there was just two in the year above me and then in my class, everyone sort of stayed making paintings. But there were really only nine, like all together. And, and, um, and I, I think I just thought there would be, it would be much more antagonistic towards painting in general, but I, it was the opposite. It was almost like, oh, that's weird. You're making a painting. It's like, good for you. <laughs> like, I don't know why you would, it was sort of like, oh, that's weird. Like, why? <laughs> but it was, um, it, it, it didn't, it wasn't really such a uh, issue. I mean, I, I occasionally you'd have a studio visit of like, why are you painting? Yeah. Um, and then, it, it, but it was never, it wasn't like you, this feeling of it, being, uh, it was actually great because it was a, a more in, it was an interdisciplinary school, so there was you'd start having these other conversations, and I felt like I was actually had these hangups that were just not interesting, like to other artists, you know, like they were like, oh, that's this weird conversation I was having in Cleveland or something, or you know, but like like a video artist was talking about something else, and it it kind of was great because you felt like oh these things can uh, kind of coexist or. Um, People could have things in common, they, although they make different, totally different work in different media, and and so that that felt really kind of um, like a relief and and actually really exciting, um, like liberating. Um, so there, it didn't feel like it was actually a really dominant thing. It actually felt like it was kind of wide open at that time. But then I think it then uh, then uh, then things I think they always go through different kind of changes or trends and well stuff. I think what you're saying, I think we both have experienced this, I mean, I particularly this week, it, it's kind of every five years or so there's a sort of panel discussion about painting dead. Is oh, yeah. Dead, paint dead again. And uh, I was said I was in, I was in this, um, in Boston in 1996 where there was a conference called Painting Dead Again, Born Again. Um, and it's just, it's amazing how it just keeps going because they don't, don't have a lot of conferences called sculpture. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's continually this idea about the, 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 the body of painting, something to do with that first quote about after photography, you know, now painting is dead sort of thing. But right. 
there's something very, as you go through the decade, and, and you're sort of painting it there, you kind of see these things kind of go full cycle, really. Is right. It is interesting how now it seems, again, I would say that um, I think going into art school, there's, the painting is kind of, everyone's got used to the fact that you're allowed to paint again. And I'd say right. there's a slight reaction against it again, that people aren't quite right. so interested in it. Yeah. Because there was a big movement a few years ago where you know, people thought painting was, but now there seems to be a sort of slight disinterest. Or the other thing is there's a lot of really terrible photo-based painting which continues to sort of go on. Right. Because I think we, in England particularly, in, in London art schools, and the, the Gerhard Richter in the Times became so dominant. Right. That everyone just sort of collapsed and fell over and just did yeah. versions of that. And that it is interesting how certain artists affect certain cities in different ways. Do you know what I mean? I think New York is very different yeah. in terms of who dominated then. Do you know what I mean? Right. Sort of different periods. Well, I think they had a huge, I mean, impact. Or I felt like that with, um, in the late 90s, I think that, that a lot of people were trying to make Luke Tolman's paintings, besides me, <laughs> you know, like, but, you know, it was, because uh, they just seemed so sophisticated, I think, but, um, but then, you you know, you're not making work about the Holocaust, and so <laughs> it's just sort of like, what am I going to, this is weird, like, this is, doesn't make sense for me, <laughs> I'm from the Midwest, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think it's sort of, it, it is interesting how it all kind of, um, I kind of felt like in 2007 or around that time in New York, 2006 or 2007, it felt like there was a real swing back against maybe pictorial painting. Um, just, and maybe, I, I was trying to think of like why this was, maybe it was because there was a lot of work being made in the early 2000s that was very crafted and like um, high keyed and, and, and pictorial. And I think at that time, people were looking at actually a lot of like um, European uh, abstraction, uh, but from like, bef I guess, from the 60s, I think. But there it just felt like there was this thing of people kind of really not wanting to go into the space. Um, but it could be, you could talk about painting outside of that space. Um, and then I was sort of wondering about that in terms of politics, if just people thought that to make a picture is to just somehow escape and then it's much more active and resistant to not go into the space just so you know that you're dealing with um, facts or potential with material or something but it kind of maybe not facts but it just it just it definitely felt like um, pictorialism it just felt uncomfortable or something and do you also you've got a show on at the moment in Berlin Oh, it's just God. Oh God okay, yeah, no, that's actually a better title. <laughs> I should have called it that. God um, face. Um, <laughs> no, sorry. No. It seems to me that's a particular series. So did you, yeah. did you, did you think about, I'm going to do, do a series of paintings on the same subject in a, in a different sort yeah. of way, you know, basically using a s the similar image over and over again to sort of work it through? I think initially I thought of making it more narrative, like, okay, there could be a painting of whatever this this um, thing could be, like God, or so, and then also, like, well, what does it do in its free time? So then what is it, what images does it make? And then, um, but then I think that started to feel too, too vast or something, and also it became a, I think I was also just more interested at that time in just the, this process of, making them like they were the process was changing for me a lot like I was there were I think there's one of them in here but they were um, becoming much more gestural and a lot of um, actually a lot of the work in this show sort of lead up to that so th they were kind of um, a series of gestures and a lot of erasure and I kind of wanted the figure to be very expansive so it was almost like you were making a, a figure and you're also making a painting at the same time that the they were kind of together in this way. Do they all have the same title, or they? Yeah, they were God one and God two and God three. They were really they, they were coming from drawing a lot too, so it was sort of, in a way, I guess they were the closest thing that I'd done to, to kind of a, a kind of abstract painting, but in a way where I wasn't really thinking about them as abstract painting. I think they just kind of went that way. 
um, it just because it was it was so much about like trying to get the right gesture and the right move. Um, in, in that seems it's diff it's like a different way of thinking in the sense that because the oh, lots of the paintings up to present and Prisoner have been the title has been kind of key. Yeah. Obviously, to um, I don't know how how early on in making the painting the title comes in. Like, do you do you think of like piano and arrange? Do you think of that before you make the painting? Or yeah, I thought of that before the painting. So it's just because it it's a dominant. Yeah. Part of the process of making the painting. I think in that way it was like just the kind of way that the language could structure an image. Like you could start thinking of like what is what is that? Like the the um it started to feel like there's a similarity between like the, the rain and then the sound of piano and then I wanted the woman's body to be the same size as the piano. So they were kind of both instruments or both sort of like furniture um in the painting and um but yeah, with the God paintings, it's actually more narrative. I, I was thinking that about that movie, Day of the Locust, um, from the Robert Altman movie. But just that, that space in that movie is so incredible. Like they're in the hills of LA and it sort of seems creepy. Like they all, all these sort of washed up actors and um, people, it seemed like, go there to get away from the world. And, and so I was thinking about this kind of space that where this figure could be and then maybe what then that figure is I thought okay maybe he's a producer and he walks around this town and there's these buildings with no you know the blackened windows and they're all very empty and there's black and white tv and it's like the four so this is like this like kind of like trying to come up with a subject you know so it's like this way of beginning to describe it and they weren't all like like that but like some of them that were you know I guess my interest in that subject was trying to come up with something that um, could have this kind of presence, but also sort of came from from nothing or something, or comes from something, it, it, but comes it, like you make it as you go along, you know. But is that is that a desire to then sort of make not have to think about the narrative so much, just to but just to make as it's find the vehicle to start to make the painting form. I think I was thinking they would be more narrative. I thought they'd be more like portraits, but they just turned out to be more like paintings. So that was kind of <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, I was happy with them in the end, but I was like, I think now that I've, I'm not making those paintings, there's one of them. Okay. If they were tall, they were tall. And um, I just, this guy sort of looks like Weekend at Bernie's or something. <laughs> but I was just sort of thinking about this, like um, really, they're all different. There, there was some that were um, female and stuff like that. But there was like, I, I think that after making them, I really missed the kind of more narrative subjects or even kind of realism. And so I, I, I'm excited to be, there's another one. But yeah, they were, I think because they were just really physical. So it'd just be one big brush stroke. And then if the brush stroke didn't work out, then you'd wipe it away with turpentine and then redo the brush stroke. So you'd start to kind of rehearse the image through the act of making it. And so I kind of like this idea of like an invisible image too, like that you the image was kind of existing in the act of making it or you could kind of physically remember how you made made part of the painting, you know? Yeah. So they... And none of these paintings are included in this show. The, the no. The singed ones, all the, the holes. No. through because... <laughs> Yeah. Is, is, that not is that because that's an earlier period, or do you feel different about it? I felt like they were, d they were it was earlier. So the, most of the work was um, more recent. But I actually felt like what I was trying to get through with those, I actually felt like at that point I needed to start drawing more. Because they were really, there's this sort of tension between what I wanted and then what, what was actually happening. And so like I think I wanted there to be still volume to the subjects, but then to have this sort of uh, air and and um, more drawing in the painting, and then but have it seem natural, and it it just felt like it was somehow not quite working. And then um, and then I just realized I had to just make a lot of drawings to um, to maybe get to that point. But it w that's you know you never know if you you do get to that point, and so yeah. but it helped. It felt it felt better, sort of. Um, what else I was going to ask you? I, I, I think 
there's this, I, I'm, I'm still a little bit interested in this idea of now, because also this, we were just talking before, um, this idea of, you know, it's been quite a long time since there's been a big survey show of painting. And in yeah. a way, you know, all the survey shows of painting that we talk about were in the sort of 1990s, and that was during the mid-1990s, and now it's nearly 20 years ago. Yeah. And it's not, there haven't been that many periods where, especially in the 20th century, where there's been a tw almost a 20-year kind of cruise period where everything just seems to sort of flop on. Right, you know I mean? yeah. But often there's, usually there's something every, at least every decade or nearly every decade where something seems to yeah. come down and say, is a sort of, this is a shift in, because from now on we're going to talk about this in a way, or suddenly a new art is emerging. And I'm just wondering about that, the I that, that what sort of, how do you feel about the currency of painting now in terms of what's happening? Do you mean like in general? I, well, I feel like at least in New York, there's a lot of abstraction, which was very different from when I was had first moved to New York. There was like hardly any, but um, I feel like also a lot of young artists that there are, seem really involved in in um, that discussion. But so yeah, I don't know. It sort of feels like it's uh, it's hard to really tell. I feel like it right now it feels s similar to maybe how it did. Um, 15 years ago in this way where you uh, different art is being made, but also you just don't really know what's feeling dominant. Yeah. I mean, there's things that are that are dominant, but they're uh, they're not always the things that are what young artists are talking about. Yeah. So I think that's... I mean, there seems to be also this debate, which is this kind of... Um, the David Rosbitt painting beside itself. Yeah. Based on this Kippenberger, and that painting being a sort of agent towards something else. Right. Because obviously been enveloped by the ideas of the internet and everything else, but actually to have a painting which stands alone on a wall in a gallery is, is not sort of enough. Right, I mean. yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm not, I don't agree with this, but I, can, I think, yeah. I just think it's interesting how I feel that there's a little bit of what was happening again in the early 90s where when Mitchell appeared and suddenly there was someone who was making abstraction, abstract painting and making physical painting. Right. Um, a lot of people who didn't really like painting were mm -hmm. very happy with that because they latched themselves to saying, okay, well, that really is what it's about. And I just feel there's a slight shift again in thinking about, um, you know, that thing of sort of theoretically thinking about painting again, thinking, actually, you're right, it's not enough just to have a thing on the wall. So suddenly right. you feel the, the battle, you know, the, the, uh, the lines have been drawn up a little again. So not, it not quite be enough yeah. just to be... I'm Thurston Sixon, I'm in the studio making paintings right. of the thing on the wall there. But I never think it is just a thing on the wall. I mean, some, and that's the great thing, that sometimes it can be a thing on the wall, and then the next day it's not, you know? So it's, it's never this fixed thing. And I, I think that also, like I actually think paintings are really social, like because you, you engage with them in, in, in a way. Like you, and they, um, they can be really strange and, and really surprising how how they they can affect you. I mean, maybe it's not like they like tell you to do things or something like that. But I do think that they, you know, they they can, you know, you can engage with them in a way that is not j just like connoisseurship or like, oh, look at this pretty painting. You know, it's I think that they they can be weird. Like I remember seeing the um, what's the painting? It was in the. I think it just happens anyway. I don't know if painters really necessarily have to put a point on it. Because, it, like, I remember going to the Museum du Rousset, and, like, uh, when I was in very young, like, when I was in undergraduate school, and I, I didn't know the painting um, origin of the universe at that point. So, like, uh, you know, going around, and, you know, there's all these paintings of, like, uh, women with parasols and all these things. <laughs> and, like, and then all of a sudden there's this painting, you know, which is like this really close cropped, intense painting. And I was just like, oh my God, this is so weird. And it wasn't just, okay, the painting is intense. And it was that it was so strange in the context of everything else, you know. So it was, yes, like a painting on the wall, but it was, it was also this other experience that had to do with the museum and the whole thing and and um, maybe even the gift shop but it's these things were always like uh they're they're associative and i, I feel like that's how most art is experienced you know not just paintings but yeah. um so i always get i think that you know 
the David Jocelyn's article. I mean, I should probably read it again, but I, I, I just think it's it's interesting, like this idea. But I think it also just happens anyway, you know. And I don't know if it makes it better to illustrate the system, or if it's better just you know you can make work and then be aware of how it could work, have this double life in that system, you know. Talking about is interested in it, but then I think modern work does do that. But then, of course, if there's work attempting to illustrate that, then it probably won't do that. Right. It's a bit like what happened in the early 90s with sort of Yvonne Beaujard, and then everyone started to make this sort of the idea of simulacra, and there was an enormous amount of people making work which was based on the idea of it, you know, even yeah. the exhibition. You know what I mean? It became, it became a buzz thing, which actually just sort of suddenly evaporated again. Right. You know, but I think it's very interesting to think. For me, anyway, how these kind of things almost kind of go over, and then certain paintings historically also painted in isolation, and then suddenly became like Philip Preston right. lived in New York and going upstate and being, you know, having two non two shows and she didn't say anything. Right. But keeping, you know, now has become the most one of the most important paintings of that period. It is. Right. It's a strange thing to think about. In a way, I think it gives one. Um, it's exci It's kind of exciting because you know that that. The, the hist there is no real history. I think that's the great thing about art history. It is just opinion. Yeah. Opinions are art historians. And it, it, that's the shifting thing about it, which is so fascinating. Yeah. And what hasn't been written of this period, particularly from 1978 or 1980 till now, there's not all the painting. Right. There's not a clear idea of actually all the things that happened and all the strands that happened. Right. And all the artists who are now emerging, particularly a number of um, women painters who suddenly and now are being, you know, it's, it's turning out they're making extraordinary work right through the 70s, 80s, 90s that just weren't being shown. Right, yeah. I feel like that part, that maybe has really shifted, I think, in a, in a good way, I think. But I was also wondering, because I, I noticed like in 2000, it seems like there's a lot of women making very kind of more muscular paintings, and I was sort of wondering if it was just that maybe... I, did, I think it's not the case now, but I maybe in the early or late 90s or early 2000s, there was this feeling of like it was off limits to guys because it was so like people would just think you were a jerk or something, <laughs> you know, like like because of like the whole, you know what I mean? Like, like the, I don't know. But I think that's different now. Like, you know, it's just like a different thing. Or that, that I think that dialogue about painterly painting is different. Because yeah, you even have like people like Josh Smith now, who like they're painterly and they make gesture gestural paintings, but they're also kind of really Warholian and cold, or you know, they're not um, you know touchy feely paintings or something. But I mean, just to, we'll just end because we need to take questions. But but in a way, what's so interesting about your work is that actually, although it's there's an element of confessional, the, the what keeps them not being sort of personal and in a way which is that sort of turn yourself inside out personal by you know in the old mid 20th century way yeah. it kind of keeps them that ref that kind of that they they tread a line between feeling i know what i'm looking at here to thinking i'm not i'm not quite sure what i'm looking at because here's someone who is trying to make an interesting painting within the confines of this form of painting it seems to me that's what is so kind of um, contemporary about them, actually, in the end. I mean, that, oh. that's unusually... That you, they, they, you can't quite consume them. They kind of keep slipping from, oh, I know what I'm looking at. Oh, no, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what's really um, very exciting and sort of generous of, of, as the artist to keep that going and, and also be very interested to see where that goes. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> but perhaps oh, we should take um, questions from the floor. I think generosity is a, a great word to use in relation to your paintings because I think they are extremely generous and I enjoy the show enormously. I saw Face Eater in the Versace collection. I'd, I'd like to ask a couple of questions around that. And um, 
it's about the relationship between the ugly and the beautiful or the banal and the beautiful, whether you actually see it that way. Um, I think there's a, a real energy and tension between uh, those two qualities and I wondered whether uh, you ag agreed with that and whether you were using it uh, for a purpose. The second question, I guess, related to the face eater is um, similar with Francis Bacon. He used medical uh, source material about the mouth of x-rays. And I wondered if you used, um, in, in the process of constructing your paintings, you used um, source material. Mm -hmm. So the face eater does actually, um, I find it an extremely powerful painting. And it, um, in terms of medical science, it reminded me of what's called a teratoma tumor, which I'm not sure. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm not sure you're, uh, and in a sense, the teratoma tumor <coughs> is where cells go wrong and don't c accumulate into being a human being. Mm -hmm. And so it's about the process of becoming, um, and to some extent, I see paintings as <coughs> simulating what a human being yeah. is. So, sorry I've gone on a bit, but the, 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 I mean the first question was about this energy between the ugly and the beautiful, and the second one was, uh, do you use any kind of source material in the construction of your paintings? No, thank you. That, um, I think with the, um, I, I don't actually think about the ugly and the beautiful when I'm painting. Like, I'll be aware, maybe if something is reading abject, I think. Like, or if there's something that reads, um, uh, maybe, maybe subtly, like you could think, okay, well, I want something very soft here, but I, it's never very clear to me, because you could have something that could is supposed to read very beautiful, and it could be really hideous. So I think, I think it's more a question of like what's working for the painting, um, and and there are limits. Like sometimes they'll be like, okay, no, this is too grotesque or something, or this is. Um, and I actually never think of like the paintings, like say the the face eater, as being a grotesque painting, because I just it, it was more of like a problem, like of like how does how would that work, like like you know technically, like as a as a portrait, but also but just in like physically technically, like how would you eat your face, and and then what point is it not a face? It's just like a, you know as you're saying like this tumor that doesn't resemble anything like a face. So I was thinking, well, if there's you know, if there there's eyes, then then it's a face. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that's clear. <laughs> but um, or it's so I think that um, in terms of the source imagery for that, there there wasn't. Except I did look at a Basilitz painting for the palette, like just the back space, just because he had one. Um, I just saw a painting of his where there was like the just I wanted it to be more toned down because the subject was kind of more um, aggressive, and I thought that it should just be painted very, just very um, somberly. I mean, not somber, but just more of like a, a portrait, you know? Um, um, but generally, I don't use source material. It's more coming from narratives or, um, or from language. In that case, it was more just trying to imagine like, like how that would work, you know? Like, what would you... You could use your tongue as a tool or something to pull your face in, or you know, <laughs> like like it wouldn't it wouldn't work out that way. Like it, I liked it if it was going upwards rather than downwards, you know, because then you're just then it you could continue <laughs> on or something. Not you've just eaten not just your face, but so I decide if it goes up, then you, there's a limit, you know. So it's like <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think when I was young, younger, like a teenager, 
I didn't know that you could be a contemporary artist. I, I didn't even know that there was contemporary art. I just thought maybe Van Gogh was the last contemporary artist, or you know, then there was Picasso or something. You know, like, because I was, I was very new to art. And I, I just remember a really, I think it was probably when I was 15, it just felt like a conscious decision of something to focus on. Like, okay, I really would like to do this and I don't know anything. Like, it was a very conscious thing of I, there's a long way to go. <laughs> like, I don't know anything. Um, but I think it was, you know, I think living in New York was, was very helpful. Uh, um, and also, there was a really great peer group that I went to school with. That, that was actually really helpful after school because we all had a um, studio building together. I remember we, we leased a, a floor of a warehouse or, and we all had studios and I think that um, that, was, that was great because it was a kind of support group that was honest but also just in terms of pr like practicality, like if someone was having a studio visit, you could be like, okay, my friend's really great and they're down the hall. And, um, and then also at that time there were a lot of, I think because of the economy in New York, it was really much easier for yo younger artists to, to really work and not have to have another, like a, another j a job or something. So, and there was younger galleries, so that, felt exciting, you know, because you could sort of feel like you were showing with people who were of your same age, you know, in, in it felt more comfortable and maybe more natural. It didn't feel scary because I think that initially I just thought galleries seemed really scary, I think. Yeah. And um, so that might have helped her a little bit. But at what point did you know galleries start to take an interest in you and say, "Oh, you know, <laughs> come back in five years when you've worked out on this." Oh, it wasn't that. I think that when that situation was just, um, I it was. I think it was honestly. I think it was like you know, I was working really hard. You know, like every you know artist who's serious about things, you're just working really hard. But then um, I think it was also very lucky. Like there was a situation where, um, the, you know, the the gallery owner was younger than me, and you know, it was, it was like so a, a situation where they, they had canceled, someone had canceled, and they were, had to put. I was in a two-person show, and so that it was really exciting. It was just sort of like, why not? You know, like I have all this work in my studio, and um, it was fun. It, it actually felt fun. It was like. It wasn't, it was very small, it was a very small gallery and then it was like on the, like a fourth floor walk up, but it felt like you were showing with friends and and, um, and, and it was really incredible though, because I didn't, I really didn't think, I mean previously to that, there was a situation at PS1 where I was sort of feeling like the worst painter <laughs> in the world, <laughs> you know, which that was just happened because there was someone at the school who recommended the same thing, an, an empty slot, and someone at the school, who, uh, at the school I went to, they asked like, oh, who do you think could be in this show? And I was sort of like kind of curated into it. And um, so I was really surprised that, that people actually responded to the paintings. And that was, I think that's how things started. I think it was just that time in New York too. It was a kind of easier time, or it felt easier. I think, yeah. maybe, but I think there's always every time is its own time. Sorry, I'm talking like crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I love your paintings. They make me smile, and I just wondered how you felt when you'd finished one. There's so much energy. I think, you know, I think when you finish it, you kind of physically feel it, you know, you're like, usually if, if the painting turned out, then it feels very good for, for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, and then you come in the next day and you're like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's usually the, 
the feeling. It's funny, like they, how can, you, do you feel that way? Like it can, it just goes up and down. Yeah. Like. I think the thing is also that emotionally we can feel great and then you have a great day change in the midst of the day and realize it's absolutely terrible. Yeah, yeah. And you have days when you have a, you feel terrible all day and you do 10 minutes of painting at the end or something and then that's the best thing you've done for all. You know, <laughs> for yeah, months. Yeah, no, that's true. So I don't, think, I don't think it's got anything to do with how you're feeling, <laughs> really. Yeah. So I think the thing is, pain doesn't care how you feel. Yeah. You know, that's I think that's true. you just have to watch it. So I think you feel up and down anyway, if you, even if you weren't painting. Right. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. kind of getting used to just watching the, it's like, you know, watching clouds go by or something. You just right. get on with painting the pain, I think. Yeah, yeah. But, I th but for me, it's I think it stops and I just don't, ev don't want to. I don't go up to it again, sort of thing. Then, yeah. then it goes on for two or three days, and then suddenly it's a week, and, yeah. and I think then it's done. And that's interesting. Yeah, you do need that that those days after. It yeah, just because it's. Yeah, I don't think you can ever think this is it. Yeah. I think sometimes through the process of something going on, having a loss, it's really unsettling. Yeah. No, it's inevitable. Yeah. You think it's done, and then it's yeah. like uh, <laughs> that <Okay>. thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have one last one? Um, this is my daughter Sky, she's 10. Hi. Um, she spends hours in front of a canvas with her easel painting paintings. Oh my God. So, um, I mean, one of the things I was going to ask you is at the age of 10, did you know that this is what you wanted to do? But you just said about getting to the age of 15 and yeah. suddenly started focusing on it. Um, so, do you have any advice on to Sky? Yeah, or wow. <laughs> she wants to well, be. That this is, is so really cool. exciting to meet her first <laughs> real life artist. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, that's fantastic. That's so cool that you're you're painting and and also like so young. That's great. That's like I had no idea when I was ten. I really didn't know at all. I I think I liked writing stories, but I I didn't know. But I guess I think if you love it, I th I think that's the most exciting thing. And and then just to you know really really. Push yourself, or <laughs> no, that sounds so weird. Push yourself. <laughs> no, sorry, no, <laughs> no, sorry, no. But you know, like, just you know, really. Um, <laughs> I know, <laughs> no, it's like this thing. No, but no, but I think it's like the thing. If you love doing it, it's just it's just so something that you can't stop doing. You know, I mean, I do remember the first time painting, like that feeling of it's really addicting because you're just like, oh, I. You, you really get involved in it. It's how, it's how you'd like to spend your time. And I think that's a huge thing. So that's, I think it's just wonderful. Like what you, you know, it's great. Yeah, and I think what's really nice is that when somebody in the family or a friend sees one of her canvases, like, will you do one for me? And then she can't wait to start and then see the joy on their faces when she hands it over and says, I've done your, I've done your canvas. So yeah. I think it's just the sharing it with other people, which obviously is, you know, thank you so much for coming and sharing you know, your talk on, on how you approach it and, you know, it's it quite clear the passion and the joy that you get from it, which, you know, is really inspiring as well, so. Yeah. Oh, oh cool, she thanks. she was also quite interested in why you don't sign them. Oh, I do. I sign them on the back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, but I, um, I think, it, I think there was a moment where I think, do you don't sign your paintings on, on the back? back. On the back. Because I think when you're making pictorial paintings, sometimes you could read the signature as part of the picture. Um, so I always put it on the back, but some people sign it on the front, and it's cool. <laughs> so it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs>